Hadith 9 Fasting is a protective shield. An Abi Ubedata Ardilahu Anhu Ala Sumatu Rasulallaha Salallahu Aleha Asalama Yakbolu Siamu Junatun Malam Yakrukha and this is narrated by Hanasa, Ibn Majah, Hakam, Bukhari, Abu Ubaidah reports that I heard the Messenger of God, divine contact upon him and wholeness, saying, Fasting is a protective shield for a human as long as they do not tear up that protection. Note, protective shield here means just as a man protects himself with a shield. Similarly, fasting protects him from his well-known enemy, shaitan. In other ahadith, we are told that fasting saves one from Allah's punishment and the fire of hell in the hereafter. Once, someone inquired from Rasulullah wasallam, what causes the fast to be torn? He replied, Tendling lies and backbiting. This hadith, when read along with many others, actually tells us to avoid such actions which cause fasting to be wasted. In our times, we are fond of wasting the time with unnecessary conversations. Some ulama are of the opinion that lies, backbiting, slander, etc. actually undo the fast, just like the eating and drinking. But the great majority of the ulama believe that the fast is not totally undone, but loses its blessings. You know, because your bad deeds are kind of tipping the balance in the other scale. Um, the ulama of Islam have mentioned six things about which care should be taken in fasting. First, one should keep the eyes away from any place where one should not look. Some go as far as to prohibit looking at one's own wife with desire, let alone another woman. Similarly, looking at any evil action, uh, any evil action or where evils committed should be avoided. Now, looking at one's spouse in the state of undress is going to lead to behavior that will break your fast. Well, that's you know understandable. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The glance." is like an arrow from Shaitan. Whosoever out of fear of Allah prevents himself from looking at evil, Allah shall grant him such light, shall grant him such light of faith, the taste and sweetness of which he will feel in the heart. The Sufis interpret the above saying to mean that those sights which should be avoided include all such places and things to take the mind away from the remembrance of Allah. Secondly, one should guard the tongue against the lies, unnecessarily, unnecessary conversation, backbiting, argumented, arguments, abuses, etc. In the Sahih of Bukhari, we read that fasting is a shield for the fasting persons. For this reason, those who fast should avoid all useless talk, joking, argument, etc. Should anyone start an argument, then say, I'm fasting. Now, Sufi, I, I don't, you gotta go, if it's from Tawasu, doesn't that mean you have a sod instead of a scene, so, um, I gotta get used to saying it that way then. Um, in other words, one should not start an argument, and if someone else starts it, then two, one should avoid taking it up, and a person who starts an argument is not an understanding person, then at least one should remind oneself that I am fasting. During the time of our Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, two women were fasting and suffered extreme hunger. To such an extent, the fasting become, became unbearable, and both were on the point of death. The Sahaba brought this to the notice of our Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who sent a bowl, commanding them to vomit into it. When they both vomited into the bowl, pieces of meat and fresh blood were found in it. The Sahaba were greatly surprised, upon which 
our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, they fasted with halal food from Allah, but took haram food by backbiting other people. From the above, it became clear that by backbiting during fasting, the fast becomes much more hard. For this reason, both women were near to death. Similarly, is the case with other sinful acts, and experiences show that for the faithful, God-fearing person, fasting is no hardship, whereas the sinful finds it too hard to bear. Now, is, is this story narrated in that book of, isn't there a book of like 319 uh, miracles of Muhammad or 300 miracles of Muhammad or something like that? Um, the miracles narrated about Muhammad are a lot more sound from a historical perspective than that which is attributed to Jesus, but we're, people hear, oh, well, Muhammad's only miracle was the Quran. Well, te technically, they're all God's miracles, right? But um, work through his physical person, other than just through reciting, um, there, there was a lot more that we know about. One should therefore stay away from sins, especially major sins like backbiting and slander, which are often indulged in to while away the time. Yeah, never speak bad about or, or mention evil for entertainment, as Sir Four mentions. Yep. It's good to have stopped watching Law and Order. Oh, there's plenty of things. That, these true crime shows and stuff like this, if, if it's just entertainment, you know. Allah says in the Quran that backbiting amounts to the actual eating of the flesh of one's dead brother. We find this also narrated in various ahadith. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on seeing some people, asked them to pick their teeth. They said that they had not tasted any meat that day, on which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, So and so's flesh is sticking to your teeth. It was found that they had been backbiting. May Allah keep us safe from this evil, because we are very neglectful of this warning. All are guilty of this, not to speak of the common man. Even the people of importance do it. To the religious people and their gatherings, do not avoid backbiting. Worst of all is the fact that we do not even realize that backbiting is, even when we suspect ourselves of this, we try to cover it up as narrations of some event. One of the Sahaba inquired from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, What is backbiting? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, To mention something about your brother behind his back, which he would resent. The Sahabi... Okay, we're talking about an individual um, companion. Said, And is it still backbiting if the thing mentioned about him is really true? Our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, In that case, if... That which is mentioned is really true. It is precisely backbiting. But if what is mentioned is false, then you will have, in fact, slandered him. That goes for political figures and stuff, too. Especially in politics, people like to backbite and slander people. Um, it's like, you're not even in the race. Why in the world are you lying about this guy, you know? Um, or accusing people of lying if it doesn't please them, or... You know, even this extent, oh, all the news, oh, I'll listen to the news, but I'll pretend like anything I didn't want to hear wasn't said. It's like, well, then don't pay attention to that garbage. Once our Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, passed by two graves, he said, to both the inmates of these graves, punishment is being given in the grave. One is being punished because of backbiting, the other because of not having, taking precautions and passing your, and it says to stay clean. Now, there's a lot of narrations, hundreds of them I've read, dealing with this. But, let's face it, there's very, you know, protection before. Supplication, once one leaves the place of rest, uh, of the using the bathroom, you know, the toilet area. Um, washing up as best as you can after, you know, and getting ablutions, you know. Preferably, you wash off the, the privates from the unclean things. Um, or, you know, at least rinse them. Um, and modesty while doing it. Those the, That's what's actually teach, taught. There are certain things people go, well, 
you know, you should bring Burks in the bathroom and dirt and pointy sticks and... Well, people generally don't make those arguments, but they make some of the other arguments of what isn't actually taught. Um, a lot of this stuff about what you consider regular life, it comes down to the intention and certain principles, and it can really be narrowed down. Some people aren't going to get the point without having those books of going to the bathroom. I, I mean, hundreds of hundreds of narrations that, that I've read, and there may be, I think there's more. Um, I, literally, someone could make a book, A Thousand and One Islamic Tales of the Bathroom, but um, Rasulullah, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a problem with Islam, it's a problem with people focusing on that. You think of, wait, this guy forgot this, this, and this, but he remembered... I remember, I remember on this day I took this to the prophets as uh, to hand to him as he was uh, over over the wall when he was using the restroom or around the corner or something. I'm like, um, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said there are more than 70 degrees of evil in interest. You know, the unlawful increase of, well, you know, you take a loan. It's, it's not just the interest, there's other things for riba, but um, that's the one that we understand. The lowest form of this, of it, is comparable to committing adultery with one's own mother, and taking one dirham of interest is worse and evil than having fornicated 35 times. Is worse and evil than having fornicated 35 times. The worst and most evil form of taking interest is falsely accusing a Muslim. Um, in various ahadi, we are strongly warned against backbiting and accusing a Muslim. I am very much wanted to write down here a number of such ahadi, because our gatherings and conversations are generally filled with these evils, backbiting and false accusations. However, I finally decided not to do so, because the topic under discussion here is something else, not actually backbiting. Well, I guess that's where the bug was earlier, but, um... So, I once again pray that Allah may keep us safe from this evil, and I beg of my friends and brothers to pray for me too. We are full of inner faults. And that poem right there... What ailment is there, O Allah, that is not in me? Heal me from every illness and grant me my needs. Verily, I have a heart that is sick. Verily, you are a healer of the sick. Thirdly, we should be careful that the ears are kept away from listening to anything undesirable. It is equally unlawful to listen to anything that should not be said. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, in backbiting, both the backbiter and the one who listens to it are equal partners in sin. Yeah, you got to be really careful what you encourage. Fourthly, the rest of the body should be kept away from sin and unlawful things. Neither should the hands touch it, nor the feet walk toward it. Special care should be taken, especially at the time of iftar, so that no such thing enters the stomach about which there is any doubt of it being halal. When a person fasts, and if iftar time breaks his fast with haram food, and more than ever now, the haram ingredients in food makes the food haram, as we know from the narrations about the about alcohol and, and pork, um, well, swine, the very dirty, very foul, you know, meat-eating animals and stuff too. No horseshoe bat. Nope, don't eat the horseshoe bat. He is like a sick person who takes medicine as a cure but also as a little poison, which kills him. Fifthly, after having fasted, it is not advisable to fill the stomach completely, even with halal food at iftar, because then the purpose of fasting is defeated. Fasting seeks to diminish one's body, bodily desires, and increases one's faith and spiritual powers. For eleven months, we eat and drink freely enough. In Ramadan, it should be cut down to a minimum. We have a bad habit of filling our bellies at iftar to make up for what we lost. And again, as suhar in preparation for the day, that's actually increasing our daily consumption. Well, if that's all you're doing, but people are overdoing it, if they're making up for what they lost 
and preparing for the day. And they're only doing that. They're only actually doing that. That people are, you know, you find people gain weight in Rohan. Other people lose weight. Me, I've gained up to 10 pounds in a Ramadan of muscle. Well, you know, virtually muscle, because I, I, I worked out and stuff like this. It's, it's not that you get fat, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just depending on what you prepare for, right? Ramadan, for such people, increases their appetite. Many such items of food are eaten that we normally do not eat at other times. This habit of complete is completely against the spirit of Ramadan and the true spirit of fasting. Imam al-Ghazali asks the same question. When the object of fasting is to conquer our bodily desires in opposition to Iblis, Shaitan, how can this possibly be done by eating excessively at Iftar? Actually, in that case, we've only changed the times of eating and not really fasted. In fact, by having various types of delicious foods, we consume even more than in normal times. The result is that instead of lessening the bodily desires, these are considerably increased. You, you, well, people get credit for their fast. I mean, look at look at um, the teachings of eating in general. It's more important than ever when you're fasting and breaking your fast to practice the other religious teachings. The real benefit of fasting comes as a result of actual hunger in the true sense. Our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Shaitan lives in the body of a man like blood, so close up his path by remaining hungry, i.e. when the body is hungry, the spirit receives strength. Apart from hunger, fasting gives us an opportunity to appreciate the condition of the poor and moneyless, and thus creates sympathetic feelings toward them. This too can be attained by remaining hungry and not by filling the stomach with delicious foods at Suhar, so that one does not feel hungry until iftar. And, you know, we're, we're not just pretending to be poor. People need to knock that off with, with that talk. Um, but, and we're not just being these fake empaths. We're really considering the case of others. Once a person went to Bishr al-Hafi, whom he found shivering in the cold in spite of having warm clothes laying at his side. That person inquired, is this a time for taking off the clothes? Bisha replied, There are numerous poor and needy ones. I am unable to sympathize with them. At least, the least I could do is be in their condition. The Sufis plead for the same attitude in fasting, and so do the Fuqaha, uh, the jurists. Well, the people who have understanding is what the term means. In Marakbi al-Falah, it is written, Do not eat excessively as suhar as this is the way to lose the object of fasting. Alama al tahtawi writes, The reward for fasting comes definitely more than hunger is really felt. Similarly, a feeling is developed for the poor and hungry ones. Our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself said, Allah does not dislike the filling of anything to the brim more than he dislikes the filling of the stomach. On another occasion, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A few morsels should suffice which can keep the back straight. The best way for a man is that one third should be filled with food, one third with a drink, while the other third remains empty. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself used to fast for days together without eating in between. I have seen my Ustad teacher, Maulana Khalil Ahmed, eating only slightly more than one thin roti, handmade bread at iftar and so her, during the whole month of Ramadan. When any one of his near ones used to urge him to eat more, he would reply, I'm not hungry. I'm really set down to eat because of my friends. Now, a lot of these ethnic foods, there's, there are differences between certain breads. Um, and I'm not just talking about this, you know, these couple main, uh, you know, this is the main type of grain or something in the bread. But with all this anti ethnic ethnic talk, well, how are you going to figure out which is which, huh? About Maulana Shah, Abd al-Rahim al-Ra'ipuri, I have heard that in Ramadan, for days together he used to fast, drinking iftar and suhar, only a few cups of tea without milk and nothing else. Once, as a most trusted follower, and Khalifa, 
Malana Shah Abd al Qadr remarked with anxiety, Hadrat, you will become very weak if you do not eat anything. To this, Malana Shah Ra'apuri replied, Praise be to Allah. I am experiencing something of the pleasure of Jannah. May Allah grant us all the ability to follow these pious souls. Amin. The sixth point is that after fasting, one should always have some anxiety as to whether one's fast has been accepted by Allah or not. This should be the case with all forms of ibadah worship. And, of course, as pointed out, um, you know, our purpose in life is, and that of the jinn, is to worship God. So we should always turn back and um, consider perfecting. both in amount of time spent and various other ways. Um, one never knows whether some important aspect may have been left out, of which no notice was taken. One should always fear that Allah may reject one's deeds. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Many reciters of the Quran are being cursed by the Quran. And one of the things is that we can turn back and we can say, you know, um, after can help fix, but what we do after a deed can help fix any issue with the deed. I mean, the deed is what it is, but like, if you if there's a problem in the required prayers, the optional prayers, and the remembrance after the, or the remembrance after the prayers can help turn those issues away in that way of speaking. He also said, on the day of resurrection, one of those whom Allah shall judge first shall be a martyr in the path of Allah. Allah shall call him and remind him of all his favors to him, which he shall admit. He shall then be asked, What have you done by the way of expressing gratitude for these favors? The martyr shall reply, I fought in your cause till I became a martyr. God shall reply, It is not so. You fought so that you, be call that you can be called a brave man, and so it has been said. Thereafter, it shall be commanded that he be dragged face on the ground and thrown into the hell. Thereafter, a scholar shall be called. He too shall be reminded of God's favors and ask the same question. He shall reply, O oh God, I sought to acquire knowledge and taught others for your sake, recited the Quran. God shall say, this is not true. You did all that, so merely that it may be said that you were learned. And so it has been said, that it shall be commanded that he too be dragged, face, face on the ground, and thrown into the hell. Now, by the reference in the Quran of, this is an Arabic Quran, well, the Arabic, the, the, the recited, well, the other revealed scriptures are were also so recited. It's not that they were... I uh, have a good religious... Uh, you get the impression with some of the New Testament. They, they were just writing down saying, Oh, I have some good philosophy ideas. Oh, wait, no, no. No one else is allowed philosophy. That's actually a New Testament doctrine, by the way. Um, and other such things. It's just he, he, had a, he thought he had some good ideas and compiled it. That's not the same thing as uh, actual inspiration, really. That's not even real inspiration. Um, let alone revelation, but the revelation is what is said. And doesn't the Bible have Jesus say that he didn't speak the doctrine, uh, his own doctrine, but the, that of whom sent him? Thereafter, a rich man shall be called, after being reminded of God's favors and admitting them in reply to Allah's question, as to what he did to express his gratitude, he shall reply, There is no worthy cause wherein I did not spend in charity for your sake. Allah's reply shall, shall be, not true, you did all that so that it may be said that you're very generous. And so it has been said, then it shall be commanded that he too be dragged face on the ground and thrown into hell. Many such incidences are related in a hadith so that a fasting person should not only be sincere but also hope that Allah will accept his fast. The above mentioned six points are compulsory for all truly righteous persons. As for the exceptionally pious ones, a seventh point is added, that is, during fasting, 
the heart should not be turned toward anyone except Allah, so much that during the course of the fast there should be no worry as to whether there should be something to eat for iftar. Some mashayik even consider it a fault to think about food for iftar, or that one should try to get something, because this shows lack of faith in God's promise of being responsible for the granting of provision. In the commentary of Ehya Ulum al-Din, the author goes so far as to relate that something for iftar, if it arrives from somewhere before the time of iftar, the Mashayik would give it to somebody else for fear that for the rest of the day the heart may be turned away from God by keeping it. This too can of course be carried out by the exceptionally pious ones. We cannot even imagine having such strong faith. Should we try to follow them without it, we may destroy ourselves. For the Quran commands, fasting has been prescribed for you. The commentators of the Quran say that from this ayah, it is seen that fasting is made compulsory for every part of the body. Thus, fasting of the tongue means to avoid falsehood. Fasting of the ears means not listening to evil. Fasting of the eyes means not to look at any form of evil and sin. Similarly, fasting of the self means to be free from all bodily desires. Fasting of the heart means removing from it the love of worldly things. Fasting of the mind means to avoiding the thoughts about anything other than Allah. And so... I, maybe we should share the purpose of life, the response, and why. And that is Surah 51. A at 56 through 58, I have only created the fire beings and humans that they may serve me. No sustenance do I require from them, nor do I require that they should feed me, for God is who gives sustenance.